This week on Q&A, journalist and author Bill Steigerwald discusses his book titled Dogging Steinbeck, Discovering America and Exposing the Truth About Travels with Charlie. Bill Steigerwald, author of Dogging Steinbeck. When did you first read Travels with Charlie and what, what is it? Travels with Charlie is um, John Steinbeck's last major work. It was uh, supposedly a nonfiction account of his trip around the country with his dog, Charlie. I read it, I remember reading it in, uh, when I was 15, so it probably would have been about 1963, uh, 64, a couple years after it came out. It came out in 62. And I just remember being um, kind of disappointed that on his great trek, he didn't come through Pittsburgh. The closest he came was Erie, about 110 miles north of us. And uh, I, I have a vague recollection of reading it, and, um, but it made no impression on me. And, um, and Steinbeck himself, we, I had to read Of Mice and Men, Grapes of Wrath. I didn't have to read his other sort of major work, and that would be uh, Cannery Row in high school. But they always say that uh, Bruce Springsteen's life was changed when he read Grapes of Wrath. It turned him into a, gave him the great social conscience and he wanted to do work for the common working man. Had no effect on me. I was a Goldwater boy, I guess. I guess Hillary Clinton was a Goldwater girl in Chicago. She's almost the same age as I am. And I was a Goldwater boy and that set me off in a whole different direction than uh, Bruce Springsteen was going. The book ends. The, the, the sh book travels with Charlie. When did the trip happen for him? On September 23rd, 1960, after a great deal of preparation, he left his summer home in Sag Harbor, New York, on Long Island, at the European end of, of Long Island. And he and Charlie set off in his camper van. It was a combination pickup truck with a, with a camper, almost like a it was almost like a, a, a sailboat cabin or a, a boat cabin on top of set into the, the bed of the pickup. Yeah, we'll show it in a minute. And he, he took off uh, on September 23rd and headed north into Massachusetts and visited his kid at uh, Eagle Brook School in, near Deerfield, Mass. Then made his way, then Steinbeck and Charlie made his way up to the top of Maine. For some strange reason, he thought. If he was going to go west, which he was ultimately going to do, he had to touch the top of Maine first. And boy, was he sorry, because he found out how big Maine is real fast. And so he worked his way. He went to Bangor and then up the coast and up to the very Fort Kent, top of Maine, and then dropped down and then actually went west. How many days was he on the road? I figure 75, maybe 77 at the most. It's, it, no one knows for sure. He kept no notes. There were no records. There are no expense reports at least that I could find or that anybody had. So um, I know when he started, September 23rd, 1960, and I know that he was, he mailed something from, is it Palahatchie, Mississippi, I think it was December 3rd, 1960, and he was pushing hard to get home then. He was sick of the road, he was sick of everything, and he was just trying to get home. What kind of dog? It was a uh, French poodle born in France, uh, 10 years old. It was his wife's, his wife Elaine, his third wife and widow. Uh, it was her dog, and at the last minute apparently he said, hey, uh, how about if I take the dog for company? He quick, quick background on you. W where did you work most of your life? I grew up in Pittsburgh. I uh, decided to get into journalism, went to Penn State, started to get a master's, didn't work out, moved to Cincinnati for four years in, say, 73, I say Derby Day of 73, and then I left Derby Day of 77, went to L.A., got in a side door at the L.A. Times as a copy editor, did a lot of freelancing, was very lucky, had 12 great years in, in L.A. I went out there with, I guess, I, I think there's a theme in my life here. Uh, a car with all, everything I owned on top, including an old typewriter, and I went out to see what would happen to me in Los Angeles. I was divorced at the time and had two kids, and I ended up getting married again and having three Hollywood-born children. That's my great gift to them, born in Hollywood. I uh, worked at the LA Times for 10 years, from 79 to 89, and then quit and moved back to Pittsburgh, as I say, to uh, raise my children and die in peace. 
you did the work at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, and then uh, I worked at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette for the '90s, basically, and then the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, which is Richard Scaife's conservative slash libertarian alternative to the Post Gazette in the OOS. On on the cover of your book, it says, "Discovering America and Exposing the Truth About Travels with Charlie." Why is there a truth to be exposed? Well, you know, I set out to do this. A, a lot of people think I set out to bring Steinbeck down, which is totally silly. Um, I did a lot of feature stories in my in my life as a journalist, uh, a Sunday feature story where you spend a week or two with somebody, and it's a long piece, and there might be analysis, and you sort of or perspective that I would bring to it. It wasn't a straight up and down repertorial piece, but more of a first person piece, although I didn't write it in first person. But I was very much in those stories. I thought that I, having quit my daily newspaper job in, in March of 2009, I thought, I'm going to write books till I die. So how about this book? Uh, I'll, fo I'll find out where Steinbeck went on his trip, and I'll follow that route faithfully 50 years later, exactly 50 years later. It's, it's almost like a Sunday feature to the 10th power, a Sunday newspaper feature to the 10th power. Uh, no newspaper today would, spend, <laughs> would, would let me go away for seven weeks or spend that kind of money. So I did it on my own dime and on my own time. My agent in New York did not think it was a good idea. Road books don't sell anymore unless you're somebody, somebody famous. Um, and I just started researching Steinbeck, and I uh, first thing I did was I bought uh, Travels with Charlie. This is, it. Uh, this is what it looks like now. This is the 1997 version. Okay. I read it first, <laughs> 1962. Yeah, sure. And um, as did probably close to a million people, it sold 250,000 copies right up uh, immediately. Um, so in any case, I went on the... I, I just started researching Travels with Charlie. I went through the book. I wrote down every place he went, every place he mentions. And I thought it would be fairly easy to find his route and determine what it was. I had a, a 1962 uh, road atlas, and I sort of plotted my trip. I, I did an awful lot of research on kind of... It's a good thing I didn't have a real job. And uh, so I just kept building this sort of database of uh, time and place line for Travels with Charlie. And... Um, Pretty soon, and I went to the Steinbeck Fest that year, the summer of 2010. Now I went in the fall of 2010, which was exactly 50 years after he went. He went right in the midst of the JFK uh, Nixon race, and I went 50 years later, the Tea Party fall of, of 2010. And um, so by the time I left, I, I had read also the original manuscript of Travels with Charlie, which is which is sort of like a holy relic. The, holy, the West Coast Holy Relic is Rosinante, the, the truck he went in. It's at the, you, you interviewed a Steinbeck scholar in that in 2001 or 2002, I think. And uh, the East Coast Relic is the manuscript, the original handwritten manuscript of Travels with Charlie. And just, uh, when, I, when I went to read it at the Morgan Library, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's an unbelievably beautiful place. It's like getting in and out of the Pentagon and the Vatican at the same time. You know, you had, appointments and very, very strict. In New York City, I've been there many times, but it's on Madison Avenue, I think. Madison Avenue at about 37th or something like that? Somewhere there. I yeah. got off at Penn Station and walked around the corner. Named after J.P. Morgan's his old yeah. home. And they brought out the manuscript that had been donated by Steinbeck in 1962, handwritten. And he wrote in longhand, uh, in pencil mostly, uh, Margin to margin, top to bottom on legal pads. It's real. It's it's. I can read the read most of his words now, but many of them are indecipherable. Um, and I compared the manuscript with the published book. Had anybody ever done that? The guy who runs the the Morgan um, told me that I was the first person to do it. I think since two thousand six and that only maybe six or seven people had done it since the year 2000. But would anybody ever publish anything no, like you did? No, no, And when you read, I call it the smoking gun, the smoking artillery piece, because when you read that, and I did that last in my research, it was kind of strange how it worked out, worked out very well. And so there I am reading this manuscript, and I had my little smartphone with the Kindle version of Travels with Charlie, and I'd page through that, and I'd look at the manuscript, you know, compare, compare. And you realize that um, the 
untruth part about Travels with Charlie is very, uh, is betrayed by the manuscript and the edits made on the manuscript. You see what he really did, that for instance that his wife joined him in Seattle and spent the next 28 days with him on the west coast. That's not in the book. You, he had written that originally in the manuscript. He had all these scenes about them traveling together down the coast, going to resorts and staying at the uh, St. Francis Hotel in, in, in San Francisco, which is where Fatty Arbuckle and Queen Victoria stayed, a, a very palatial place. And you, I just realized then that there was a, quite a large gap between what Steinbeck wrote and what he actually did on his trip, who he met, where he went, and who he traveled with. You, and, you actually call it a fraud. I did, and that, that was a sort of a slow process. Um, in my notebook, ver the day I, uh, I read the manuscript, I wrote, scribbled the thing that this is a fraud, but I didn't use that word until l much later. Um, and it was really introduced by a friend of mine at the Post Gazette who put it in the subhead. <laughs> he called it, he called it something of a fraud, and I kind of liked the way that rang. And in a sense, it is a literary fraud. It was, it was marketed, sold, reviewed, and taught for 50 years as, as a true story, as a true account of John Steinbeck's trip, who he met, and what he really thought about America. How, how, old, was how old was he when he made the trip? He was 58, and not in great health. He had had a couple strokes, and he, he was fine, but I mean, he was not a, a young man. Let, let's take a look at that. When we were out there at this, in Salinas at the Steinbeck Center back in 2002, we did a series on writers. Here is Tom Steinbeck and Rosinante, which, by the way, what was that named after? Uh, Don Quixote's horse, I hope. <laughs> I'm a nonfiction guy. But that's okay. that's what. So what I remember about this most was basically the, the setup of the vehicle. And what is it? What is it? Kind it of it's, just, it's just a Ford pickup truck, but it had one of the first camper bodies that I'd ever seen. This was not a major sport in those days. There were very few large campers that had contained toilets and, and all the rest of it. And uh, he sort of thought it made him uh, look rather invisible on the roads, not realizing there weren't that really that many of them in those days. But he, it was so, he called it the turtle. Rosinante, why did he name? Rosinante, uh, because my father was a great fan of Don Quixote. And Rosinante was Sancho Panza's mount. And um, it's just really amazing that he occupied this space. I wonder if I can still get in here. Did he sleep in here? Yes, this table goes down, and well, there was another piece of mattress that went on top of it, so you could sleep this way. Did you talk or meet with Tom Steinbeck? No, I tried several times. Um, he was one of the first guys I wanted to talk to, really, because I figured who would know more about the real trip and, and what went on on the West Coast than, than Tom. And um, it, was, it was kind of awkward. His, his wife was kind of tough to get through, but then I, I sort of gained her, I think, confidence, and she warmed up to me a little. Uh, but I never, I never, he was in Santa Barbara. I was never really going to be in Santa Barbara. I was, I offered to go down there. I never, I never did meet him. I never talked to him. I, I could have talked to him on the phone. I didn't need to actually meet him. Why should anybody care? <sighs> Uh, that's a good question. Not about your meeting with Tom Steinbeck, but about but this the whole, whole thing. Um, in a way, um, if I were only doing a book about the the fictionalizing and some of the the, the sort of deceit that went into the writing and marketing and publishing of, of Travels with Charlie, I don't think that's enough to write a book about. I think, and that was part of my problem selling the idea into the traditional publishers in New York. I had an agent; we tried everywhere. Road books don't sell. Steinbeck's not important enough or interesting enough to anybody. So I didn't have um, I didn't have a real. Neither one of those made a book, but I think everything made a book. And my adventures, my sort of innocent, naive attempt to follow this trail, and then applying basic thirty years worth of uh, journalism experience to the process, as opposed to. Uh, being a, a, a dog fan or a travel fan or a Steinbeck fan. I was a journalist. I followed the trail. There is, there is no great reason uh, to, to say this was a, 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 is a big deal, I don't think. Um, but there's fiction and there's nonfiction. And there is quite a divide between the two these days. And they have creative 
nonfiction and narrative nonfiction, all these different um, uh, applications of fictional techniques to nonfiction that either are okay or not okay, depending on how far you go in making things up or, or fudging the facts or changing things around. I mean, as they say, uh, all good nonfiction contains fictional uh, techniques, uh, the narrative, and 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 all non uh, nonfiction contains fiction, and, and fiction contains. He won a Nobel Prize for Literature. What did he get it for? His whole body of work? Pretty much so. I think he had um, he won it in 60, 1962, uh, a couple months after Travels with Charlie came out. And uh, I guess it just came out recently that that he was sort of a uh, sort of like a uh, uh, okay we don't have anybody else worthy of it this year we'll give it to him because they had a bunch of people and they all sort of uh, did uh, I can't think of it, the one the woman who wrote out of Africa was one of the finalists and uh, they just they gave it to, to Steinbeck and they just released the uh, the notes from the Nobel Committee and he was sort of a um, not a second choice, but like, a, eh, okay, we'll give it to Steinbeck for his body of work. But he travels with Charlie. He had just come out. It was a big success at the time, big commercial success. They did mention that in the release about the the award, and he had written uh, our winter of Dis the winter of our discontent uh, two years earlier. Two Let, let's ago. look at John Steinbeck back in 1962 as he accepts the award. It is customary for the recipient of this award to offer personal or scholarly comment on the nature and the direction of literature. At this particular time, however, I think it would be well to consider the high duties and the responsibilities of the makers of literature. Such is the prestige of the Nobel Award and of this place where I stand that I am impelled not to squeak like a grateful and apologetic mouse, but to roar like a lion out of pride in my profession <laughs> and in the great and good men who have practiced it through the ages. What do, you th what do you think he was like? Or what do you know from what your research has shown? Um, he's likable in a lot of ways, and I guess he's... Um, uh, he, he became rich and famous. He started out as a struggling writer. He worked hard to become rich and famous. Um, he was uh, uh, a big guy. You can tell there he had a big sort of heavy voice. And uh, I think he was a funny guy, a playful guy. Um, he loved to travel. He traveled an awful lot with, uh, with his family. At one point, they all took off for Europe, the two boys, a tutor and everything for almost a year. Um, he was, I think, smart. Uh, he, he was a great writer. He was a, he was a great nature writer, and and, and um, he had trouble becoming a journalist. At, at 25, he basically got fired from a New York newspaper because he couldn't tell the story straight, tell the facts straight. He was always embellishing, which is kind of funny uh, to me. But um, he's a tremendous writer, and any journalist would love to uh, be able to to capture uh, the details and the uh, colors and feeling and of, of nature and, and just of reality as he, as he took it in. Now, um, his biographer Jackson Benson claims that he was kind of cranky and not as good to his kids or his couple of his wives as possible. I don't know anything about that. You know, I, that's, to me, I, I guess I, my argument would be that of all the great celebrities and writers of his age, he was a pretty normal guy. He didn't, there isn't any really horrible stories about. Let, let's look at some video uh, at uh, Steinbeck's Sag Harbor home. You took this video. Oh. What, when, okay. Do you remember when it was? Well, it would have been, um, is either the night before or the day of uh, the 50th anniversary of his leaving. You were so, starting your trip then? Yes, this was, the, uh, I, I, once I see it, I can tell you when. Okay, but this is only a minute. We'll watch it and get your reaction. This is where Steinbeck would have started this trip. September 23rd, 1960, in the morning. This is his house on a private lane in Sag Harbor, very close to the border with Southampton. His house sits back there. 
he planted that tree right by his door. It was tiny then, now it's huge. And out in the yard is the little writing house that he, where he wrote. This is the little house, the little writer's house, little writer's shack that he used to write his books in. He'd come out here where he couldn't lie down and where basically no one could visit him. He called it that, Joyous Guard. And uh, it looks uh, like it's in pretty good shape. The sun is going down behind it, which makes for a pretty spectacular, it's a pretty spectacular spot. Who controls that house now? His, um, w his last wife, Elaine, uh, her heirs have control of the house in some way. Is it a, a museum? No, no, it's, it's there. I, no one was living in it. It's well taken care of. Um, the New York Times had come by and taken pictures of the inside of it. I didn't look inside the windows or anything that day um, because I wasn't invited. But um, the Times did come and take a bunch of pictures, and it, it looks like it's pretty much the way it was when he left it. But uh, I think people live there or have lived there, and there's a sort of a struggle over the house as to what what to do with it, whether. It should be turned in there. Go back to what you said earlier about the, your agent said nobody wanted a book of uh, travel, uh, mm -hmm. these tours. Why not? What's happened? I don't think road books work anymore. I mean, unless you're, I'm trying to think, well, um, uh, William Least Heat Moon, who um, wrote um, Blue Highways. Blue Highways, yeah, sorry, I'm blacking out here. Um, that was a, started out very small, but it grew into a big, big book, a big road book. I'm trying to think if there have been any other major ones since, and I don't think. It's just that the publishing, the traditional publishing industry is all about selling books. And if they don't think it's going to sell, they don't care who you are or what you're doing, they don't want the book. And I was told uh, by way of my agent who got responses from the editors at the publishing companies who would read my proposal you know, the, the idea is when you go to write a book, you write a proposal. And you, the, the, the saying is that you, um, you sell the proposal, then write the book. So I had to pitch this whole idea, what I was going to do, why I was doing it, wh what I knew about Steinbeck's book not being factual, uh, and how I was going to compare my America in 2010 with Steinbeck's 1960 America, all that stuff. And basically, I guess I was about 0 for 35. Uh, in, in New York on this. It would, be, it would be great if this became a, a bestseller because I would have a final laugh, but I, I'm not holding up that much hope for that. Um, but it turned out much, much better than I ever thought uh, because uh, of not only my trip and the people I met, which didn't surprise me that I met so many wonderful people, interesting people, driving around like a maniac for 43 days, 11,000. 276 miles around the country, um, I knew that I would meet good people. I've done things like that before. I've been on the road as a journalist. I know that just if you're alone and you're on the road, you will meet many interesting people. You're not going to meet the kind of people that Steinbeck invented and put in his book because you don't meet uh, traveling Shakespearean actors in the middle of a cornfield in eastern North Dakota, as he said he did and didn't. But you do meet a farmer on a big Ford truck. How, how do you know he didn't meet that Shakespearean actor? Because he betrayed where he really was on his trip. He, he took his trip, he took no notes. He had no tape recorder, virtually no notes. Um, he did write letters to his wife from the road, almost uh, very, very often. How and many of those did you read? Uh, probably about a total of maybe seven or eight. Where were they? They were, um, conveniently, they're in a book called uh, Steinbeck, A Life in Letters, edited by his uh, widow. And he left Chicago, uh, where his wife joined him on the trip after about 10 days. And he drove from Chicago to Seattle. It's 2,100 miles in seven days. Each night, he wrote a letter. To his, his wife flew back to New York. He, it's just him and Charlie. That's, he's averaging about three or four hundred miles a day. 
Each night he wrote a letter to his wife and he said where he was. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You compare that with what he says he does in his book and you realize that the night he says in the book that he's camped out under the stars in the, in the cornfields of eastern North Dakota meeting an itinerant Shakespearean actor and then next night sleeping in the badlands hearing the barking of coyotes those two nights did not exist. They're pure inventions. He was actually, as he said in a letter to his wife, he was in a motel in Beach, North Dakota taking a bath. So he betrayed, he and then his wife inadvertently betrayed all of this too by publishing those letters. Now I don't know if those letters would have ever seen the light of day, but I was able, if anybody, I've often said to people, what I did was nothing spectacular. Any kid with a library card and, and a healthy dose of skepticism could have done what I did. You mentioned William, <clears throat> at least he Mooney's been here a couple of times. I want to run a clip of him talking about John Steinbeck and see what oh, you cool. think about what he says about himself. Mm -hmm. I think that, that Blue High is a, is, a, is a better book than Travels with Charlie. It's a better written book. It's, it's a, a better executed book. But I must say this in, in John Steinbeck's defense. He, uh, he was recovering from cancer at the time. And this was really his, 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 his swan song, so to speak. And he took that trip, a challenging trip, uh, about three months also. He took that uh, in recovering from, uh, from cancer, and, and he never really traveled again after that. Uh, so for, for a man who was ill, it's a, it's, it's a tremendous effort. I admire that tremendously. But it's not his best writing. Reaction to that characterization? I agree. Uh, I agree, but he, he, it wasn't cancer, it was a series of strokes um, that was his malady. But he was in pretty good shape. He, he, I, I think it's, it's easy to say, it, it'd be too nice, to, it's too easy on Steinbeck to say that he was sick and, and that's why he had to make up this stuff that he made up. Um, there are contemporaneous reports about Steinbeck when he was on the road. He met Kurt Gentry who wrote the book Helter Skelter way back, interviewed Steinbeck in his hotel in San Francisco. And Steinbeck was playful and full of vim and vigor and, and others who saw him on this trip too, especially in San Francisco. He wasn't a sickly guy moping around the country. He was, he was full of uh, energy and, and, and good health apparently. And he wasn't totally depressed either. He wasn't uh, based on these uh, observations of, of people. And he, his uh, local paper, the uh, Peninsula Herald um, in Monterey, in Monterey, Monterey Peninsula Herald, I think it was called at the time, went over to his cottage in Pacific Grove and found Steinbeck there fixing a fence and they got a big picture of him. He's got a Zippo lighter around his neck and he was banging away at some fence trying to fix it and it was a very nicely written feature. He's perfectly fine. Back again, just briefly, born in, in Salinas and California, went to Stanford, John Steinbeck, mm -hmm. lived in Sag Harbor, which is way out on the end of Long Island. And Manhattan at the same time. And Manhattan. A summer house, yeah. And how long did he live in the Manhattan, Sag Harbor area? Um, from the mid 50s, he died in 68 and... Um, 66 he, years old. Yes. And I would say he was, he was in New York, th basically the last 20 years of his life he was in New York. Go back to when you were at the Morgan Library in Manhattan and you're reading the transcript as he wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you blame for changing the transcript uh, as it got finally to the book that was published? I think, let's put it this way. Steinbeck came back from his trip, he had to write a book. That was, part, that was why he took the trip. It was supposed to be a nonfiction account of his trip. He didn't have a whole lot to talk about. It. Uh, he initially in his manuscript wrote all about how his wife and he were, were looking for a, a, a good restaurant uh, on the Oregon coast and having their troubles out there. Well that was all cut out by the editors. Other things that were cut out from the original manuscript that Steinbeck wrote and handed in was all of his politics. The, the, the Nixon-Kennedy election was on Steinbeck saw every one of the four debates. He was on the road. It's he part saw of the everyone. way you tracked him, as I remember. Yes, because you could tell, okay, he said he saw the debate in wherever he was, and so you knew he was there on that date. Um, that was taken out. And some of the other editing uh, is clearly designed to remove 
uh, his wife uh, remove any mention that he paused. He says in this manuscript, I paused five times. Uh, Chicago, Texas twice, uh, California and Seattle. Well, when, what he was talking about was he stopped driving like a maniac and he was in Seattle for three or four days with his wife. They drove down the coast leisurely to San Francisco for four or five days, then down to Pacific Grove, Grove to the Steinbeck family cottage for another, say, 10, 12 days. It was Mr. and Mrs. Steinbeck the whole time. Charlie was like, oh yeah, well, there's a dog somewhere. You know, he was out of the picture pretty much. In fact, at one point Steinbeck had had to write a small paragraph that said, basically, people are asking what happened to Charlie. This is after his wife joins him in Seattle and everything, it, when he says we, it's, it's Elaine and John. It's not Charlie and John. It's we, 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 we did this and somebody must have said to him, hey, wh where's Charlie? He's disappeared. Steinbeck wrote about a page and a half of a legal tablet saying, people have asked what happened to Charlie. Well, when my lady fair joined me in, in Seattle, Charlie took his third position in the family thing. Yada, yada, yada. He's fine. Yada, yada, this. Well, obviously that never appeared in the book because what they did do <laughs> is that editors went in and just expunged Elaine entirely from the West Coast. 30, almost 30 days of, of Elaine's presence with John on the West Coast. They weren't camping out. They weren't studying America. They were basically on a vacation. You talked uh, about his relationship with Hedley Stevenson and uh, LBJ, and then the last chapter was supposed to be on JFK. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I want to show the video of you at, is it Libertyville, Illinois, where you've got this on, on Stevenson? Oh, yeah, at Adley Stevenson's <clears throat> old Adley uh, Stevenson, former farm. governor of Illinois, presidential candidate, in 1952-56. And Steinbeck desperately wanted him to be the candidate again in 1960. Did, did he write for him? He uh, helped him with speeches and, and things and, and did some writing for him. Uh, it wasn't like he was the big main ghostwriter, but he, they had quite a bit of correspondence, which I saw uh, quite a bit of at the Princeton Mud Library, Princeton. And Steinbeck was very partisan, very political, and geopolitical, and national politics and he was sending, sending um, Adlai Stevenson all kinds of advice and jokes and ideas and here's your video from uh, Libertyville Illinois Stevenson's historic house and farm Steinbeck came here 50 years ago and I suspect they walked in the woods because in a later letter Stevenson to Stevenson Steinbeck reminded him of their walk in the autumn, blazing autumn woods. Great room and Steinbeck's, oops, I mean Stevenson's <laughs> books. Fabulous. As you went around, what kind of a camera did you use to shoot this stuff? I just had a little Canon HD handheld. What'd camera. you do with it? Uh, the what, video. The video. I I created some YouTube videos. I I thoroughly documented my trip. It's kind of scary. I, I had a, a Nikon digital camera. I had that Canon video, and of course my notebooks, ten or twelve notebooks filled up with things, and. Um, it makes it great because when I got back, I could look at that video and use it to help me describe whatever it was I was going to write about. Do you have a price you can put on what it cost you to do the driving and the gasoline staying and then writing it and then having, and you self published it? Yeah, it's, this is a, an entire, this is a one man <laughs> project what it cost for you? good and bad, I guess. Um, I figure it cost me $5,000, uh, and that's with about 2,000 of sort of fuzzy, uh, fuzzy accounting, uh, you know, whatever, deterioration of my car, depreciation of my car, and, and incidental things that I just sort of lumped together. But I figure it cost food, gas, and lodging was a little less than $3,000. What kind of a vehicle? A Toyota RAV4, which I purchased, leased, uh, after testing out the back and seeing that I could stretch out in the back and sleep if I needed did you, to. How often did you sleep in the car? Um, I think 20 times, 20 nights out of 43. 10 of those were in Walmart parking lots. Walmart, I love Walmart. I'm not a Walmart basher. 
I don't shop there, but <laughs> I do like them. And uh, they have a policy that, uh, a, a corporate policy w that welcomes people to sleep in their lots overnight, uh, truckers, RV people, and it goes all the way back to Sam Walton. The fellow you mentioned <clears throat> earlier, Kurt Gentry, who was mm -hmm. he again? Kurt Gentry uh, wrote Helter Skelter, that's his claim to fame, uh, with Vincent Bugliosi in, uh, I'm not sure what year, 68 or so, late 60s, about the, the Manson killings. Um, at the time, in 1960, when Steinbeck came through, Kurt Gentry was a huge Steinbeck fan, and he was a freelancer for the San Francisco Chronicle. He heard that Steinbeck was coming to town. Um, he went, he called Steinbeck and begged him for an interview. Steinbeck said fine. Gentry showed up with a bag of 21 Steinbeck books that Steinbeck signed every one of them for him. And uh, Gentry is a, is a really good old fashioned writer slash journalist. Um, he's a tough guy, interesting guy. He's lived in North Beach, San Francisco for, for since 1955. He was really nice to me. Um, it was great to meet him, to interview him, because he went and hung out with Steinbeck for that half hour, 40 minute interview. You, you said it was at the Washington Bar, uh, Square Bar, and, and, yeah. and it's not there anymore? No, I don't think so. Yeah. And North Beach is right there near right. that in San And North Francisco. Beach is where City Lights Bookstore was, and Kerouac, and, and the Hungry Eye, all that, that was at Broadway in uh, Columbus. Huge, at that time, in 1960, it was like the, the past, the, the present and future of American pop culture. The uh, Smothers Brothers were there. Mort Saul was there. Uh, it was a jazz thing at the time, but, you know, the rock and roll was coming and City Lights was there. How old was Kurt Gentry when you met with him? I think he was about 28 or 29 then. But I mean, when you met with oh, him. Oh, when I met him, he was 79. Still alive now. Yeah, and still writing a book. He was writing a book about the mob in Vegas. So he's still going strong. So go back to the cost of this, $5,000 for the trip itself. Uh, you, did you buy the Rob 4 new? Uh, I leased it new, yes. You mm -hmm. leased it new, so yeah. you have, still have it. Mm -hmm. And what, um, in addition to that, what did it cost you to uh, get this book published? Um, nothing but time. That's the beauty. Of, it's an Amazon book. It's an e-book. It cost me nothing to do the e-book. Amazon makes everything extremely easy and smooth and cheap to do. And then I created the, the paperback version, uh, zero. The paperback uh, didn't, didn't cost you anything? Why not? It's print on demand. You go to Amazon right now and you can either get the ebook for about five bucks or you can get the hard copy or the paperback copy for I think 12 or 13. And as soon as you push the buttons, they call somebody in, in South Carolina and they print the book and mail it to you. There's no inventory cost. In the old days, you'd have to, I, I would not do this. If, if it weren't for Amazon, we would not be sitting here. That book would not exist. What's the reaction you've had, if any, from the Steinbeck family? I've heard uh, nothing from the family. I've heard nothing from anyone, really, in, Steinbeck, in the Steinbeck world. Um, you know, I was a, a journalist who um, was used to dipping into things for two, three weeks and then leaving and doing something else for two or three weeks. You become the expert and then you forget everything and move on to something else. And the Steinbeck uh, world that I've been in has been my home here now for uh, almost three years. And I've spent more time on this than probably anything in my life. Um, it's both a, a, a good thing and a bad thing. It gets to be kind of a burden. I'm used to, I'm interested in everything, you know, city planning, you know, I'm a libertarian so you know that I'm uh, very much uh, full of ideas and opinions. Go back to John Steinbeck's politics. Uh, what did he think of uh, General Eisenhower? He, he uh, made fun of him. Uh, he made fun of his syntax, as which they always used in to print? do. In um, print? I don't know. In letters he sure did with, to Stevenson and, and, and others. Um, I don't, can't remember if there's anything about uh, Eisenhower in Travels with Charlie, but a lot of what was taken out of Travels with Charlie was Steinbeck's partisan sort of sniping at Nixon, mainly, and a little bit at Ike, I think. What do you think of Nixon? Oh, he hated Nixon. He really did not On like what Nixon. point was that? What was the reason? You know, um, I, 
I think Steinbeck was openly, and again, this was taken out of the book, he was a partisan Democrat, and he said that in the original manuscript twice, and I think both times it was taken out. He just did not like Republicans, and uh, though he had sort of grown up the son of a Republican, his sisters were all Republicans, Monterey County in California went for Nixon in 1960. But he hated. Where did you find the letter uh, that he wrote to his editor at Viking? Um, that is is fairly easy to find. It's in I think it may be parts of it, maybe in one of the major biographies. It, it it's floating around a lot. Uh, Bill Barrett wrote a book where he sort of uh, he where he he went from across the the waste of America from say Mer New York to San Francisco. He had he uses that paragraph as a, as a way to, you know, as sort of a jumping off point to do his book. And he, it, it's there, it's, it's commonly found. I, I can't remember where I found it. I think it's in the biographies. Well, you, I'm going to read some of what uh, John Steinbeck wrote to his editor at Viking. When mm -hmm. was it? After the this travels? This would have been uh, after the travels and probably in the summer of 61 when he was struggling to, uh, Write travel, still struggling, almost nine months after his trip ended, to write travels with Charlie. Uh, thinking and thinking for a word to describe decay, not disruption, not explosion, but simple rotting. It seemed to carry on with a weary inertia. No one was for anything, and nearly everyone was against many things. Negro hating white, white hating Negro, Republicans hating Democrats. Although there is little difference. In all my travels, I saw very little real poverty. I mean, the grinding, terrifying poorness of the 30s. That at least was real and tangible. No, it was a sickness, a kind of wasting disease. There were wishes, no, but no wants. And underneath it all, the building energy like gases in a corpse. When that explodes, I tremble to think what will be the result. Over and over, I thought we lacked the pressures that make men strong and the anguish that makes men great. The pressures are debts, the desires are for more material toys, and the anguish is boredom. Through time, the nation has become a discontented land. What's the difference between what he's saying then and what we are thinking now? I think that was a, a horribly pessimistic and, and, and um, inaccurate account of America. I think, um, I, don't know, I don't know where he, get, he gets that really. I mean, I have a I have a grudge against uh, people who are rich and famous and live in New York, and then who go out into flyover country and and say that the people out there are too materialistic. These are people who have everything they already need, and then they go out and they compl complain about regular Americans wanting trucks and toys and things like that. How was America different for you once you got back off this trip? Um, not much. I I knew. My trip did not surprise me. I had been around the country enough doing small, real journalism type stories. And the people I met on my trip were no different from the people I had been meeting for 20, 30 years. Name They're some good, of the characters. Uh, uh, the guy who, uh, a German American uh, who had a restaurant in Wisconsin named uh, Rolf, Rolf, I can't think of his last name. Um, I go into his restaurant in the, uh, in, in the dark of, of, a, of a night, and, and he comes out of the kitchen. He's all covered with grease. He's a big man, and he was back there cooking. He owns the place. He tells me his life story. He tells me how uh, he had seen Hitler when he was eight. He was born in Frankfurt. and You know, just amazing little stories, which I, I retell in there at length, because I, where do you meet a guy like that except in the woods of Wisconsin? What about the guy, I tried to find this on YouTube and couldn't, the guy that you said has made his own YouTube videos? Is I it, couldn't find it either. I think he may have taken them down. Uh, a guy named Bob, and he was a wild man. It was O-E-H-N-E-R. I yeah, know something I tried to like find that. it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there was a one strange day in Wisconsin. I met four amazing characters in, in one long day. Bob was the second one. The first one was this guy in camo. He, had, he was riding a camo a... a uh, uh, ATV, ATV, yeah, yeah, all, ter all terrain <laughs> vehicle, right. and he he was sitting on the corner in the middle of nowhere, and he's the guy who just, he was like an MSNBC uh, Democrat, 
just ranting. And he was tremendous. And he spoke so slowly, I could just write every word he said. And he was scary. And then I met Bob, who was even scarier, because he had done all these YouTube videos. And he was challenging Tea Party people and Republicans to fights <laughs> through his YouTube thing. And he was a, a, a total character, a nice guy, but a certifiably and proudly kind of crazy. But he would say that Tea Party folks are scary. Yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, being a libertarian, I can sort of, I can adapt to b all ends of the spectrum. You know, I can, I, I, you know, I said to Bob, I'm not a Republican. You know, <laughs> he hated Republicans. He hated CEOs. He called them Hell's Angels in suits. And then, and then I met uh, Rolf, the, the restaurateur, and he was a tremendous guy. We've got some more video that I want to show. There's one of uh, when you visit the Spalding Inn where Steinbeck allegedly stayed instead of his camper. Why do we say allegedly? Because um, there's no real, real, real proof. There are two people told me he did, both of whom worked at the, at the uh, inn in 1960. But I, that allegedly may be just leftover, the leftover caption from when I first put it up there. Because okay. I later pretty much proved that. Here, here's he here's the video that we're, we're talking about. The Spalding Inn, where Steinbeck really stayed on one of his passes through Lancaster, New Hampshire. It's a lovely place. I haven't seen it yet. And here's how you get to it. This is where Steinbeck stayed, according to a good local reporter named Jeff Woodburn. Steinbeck was seen here by six or seven people in there, dressed to the to the nines. It's not really a camper, is it? Did uh, did you find yourself get, getting irritated as you went through the trip? <laughs> not in a real sense. Uh, I think early on I realized that. Uh, what was in the book and what he really did were, were often very far apart. And um, I, I, I didn't feel like, yeah, I think some, some people have accused me of being on a jihad of some kind, you know. I was just doing basically, this is what happens in journalism. You set out to do something. I had to follow the trip. And, uh, and I had to complete the trip or I, it was no, no use doing it. And, um, Were you by yourself the whole time? Yeah. Did you have a dog with you? No. Why not? I thought of a dog for about five minutes, and then I thought, how am I going to go crazy, uh, go around the country this fast and worry about a dog, too? Um, I didn't have a dog at the time. Um, no. You can, you, you've got to do a trip like this alone. It's interesting. Steinbeck, when he set out to do this trip, he had great plans, and it was going to be what amounts to what what would have amounted to a great journalism project by a great writer. Uh, he was going to go alone. He was going to uh, take pictures. He was going to send dispatches from the road to various uh, to a newspaper chain if he could get one going. He did none of that, and he didn't travel alone. He knew he had to go alone, but he didn't. He wasn't alone very much of the trip. But you tried all along the way, and you write about it in your book that, to get people to follow you. Yes, uh, I did a daily blog back to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette called Travels Without Charlie. And so two or three times a day, I would send back much of what turned out to be the core of that book, who, the people I met, what I did, what I was doing, where I was, photos, uh, no video at the time. When I got back, I started putting up the videos on uh, YouTube. So I documented my trip pretty much as I went. And that got, that got to be a lot of work. But I had fun. I had no, this was not torture. Um, I had a, a great time. I met people I'll never forget. The, uh, the, and they're in the book, thank God. And, and thank God I had written so much about it as I went. Because to, re, to, re, uh, uh, to, put it back, to put it together after the fact, I think, would have been very tough. You, you have a reference to this network in your book when you talk about the call-in mm. show and that Steinbeck wrote 
about the voices that he heard sounding more and more the same across the country. But you say, oh, tune in this network and listen mm -hmm. to the calls come in and you hear a lot of different voices. Mm -hmm. What was your experience out there? Did you hear a lot of accents? I heard plenty of accents. Uh, I taped one, uh, a, a guy in Maine who gave me directions to, to the house that Steinbeck stopped at on his trip. And uh, it, it was, he was so amazing. I could hardly understand what he said. That I turned on my smartphone and, and taped the directions he was giving me because his accent was so heavy. He had a great accent. Uh, someone waited on me in Texas, a, a waitress. I could barely understand what she was talking Her accent was so heavy. There are plenty of people with accents still in America. Uh, I live in Pittsburgh where there are still plenty of people with a Pittsburgh accent running around. You'd think that TV and radio and everything else would have killed them, killed it off, but it hasn't. On the front of this cover I have here of the Steinbeck Travels with Charlie book is a picture of John Steinbeck sitting in front of a tree with the, the dog in front of him, yes. the, the, the poodle. It, you, uh, you talk about this picture in, uh, in your book. They, that picture was also used as part of the ad campaign, and I think that's what I'm referring to. They did full-page ads in the, in the New York Times and elsewhere, I guess. That's the picture they used with Steinbeck and Charlie together. Charlie was a big dog. Right. Yeah, apparently he was. I mean, he was, a, he was a standard poodle, which I guess means he's, he wasn't a baby poodle, that's for sure. How many, did you find anybody that could tell you how many books of, the, of uh, Travels with Charlie have been sold since he published it in 62? The Penguin Group now owns the rights to Steinbeck's books. When Steinbeck wrote them, it was the Viking Press. The Penguin Group people said, uh, I said, can you give me an estimate of how many Travels with Charlie books have been sold in, throughout history? And they gave me the number 1.5 million. Um, when it first came out, uh, somewhere I saw the figure of 250,000 copies were sold within the first month or two or three. So if somebody wants your book, they can get it on Amazon as right. an e-book or as a paperback? Both. What's right. the paperback Either cost? Uh, it's twelve ninety nine, I think. I, I can change. That's the beauty. I can change. I can make it <laughs> ten ninety nine or nineteen ninety nine. Five minutes after I leave. Is it any book in any bookstore? Uh, no, it is not on any bookstore. Only on Amazon. Can they find your video on the YouTube channel? Yes. If you if you go if. Um, I have a website called The Truth About Travels with Charlie, and it's uh, truthaboutcharlie.com. If they go there, they can eventually find my, my YouTube videos. Here's some video at Fremont Peak. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Uh, it's a beautiful place. It overlooks, it's the highest point in Monterey County, in Steinbeck country. And um, it is in, uh, it's about 20 miles from Salinas, and it looks over that whole Salinas Valley. And it's a little peak, and you might, it's maybe about three times the size of your studio, and you have to sort of be a mountain goat to get there. It's a great place. How long did it take you to get up the top? Uh, it's a 15 minute walk from the parking lot. But, but what it is, it's, it, to me, I love it because there are no rangers, there are no guards, there are no railings. There are no, it's, it's a state park, yet it's, you're pretty much on your own. Well, let's look at what you uh, videotaped. Yeah. This is kind of high up here. In fact, it's ridiculously high and a little, a little scary Get up here. I'm on Fremont Peak overlooking Steinbeck country. That glare behind me is the sun bouncing off Monterey Bay. Hope I don't kill myself trying to show this. Already dropped the camera and miraculously it seems to be still working. I'm putting I'm swinging around. I'm now looking into the sun, as you can see. <laughs> what did this Fremont Point mean to John Steinbeck? What, there's a lot of good writing in Travels with Charlie, and I think one of my favorite uh, sections is when he uh, is leaving Monterey County and headed, heading back east uh, after, on, his, on his trip, and he says that he goes up to the top of Fremont Peak, which he could always see from his childhood home. You can see Fremont Peak, the little point, from everywhere in the Salinas Valley. And he went up there, and he used it as, I guess, as a metaphor to, to go up there and look back in space and time on his life. And, and it's some really good writing. And uh, I never 
knew anything about. I mean, I went there because he went there, and it's a, it's hard to get to. You have to go around the back of the mountains, then you have to go up 11 miles through this narrow, all this narrow road along these bridges, and then you have to walk to the top where I was there in that picture, in the in that video, and it's worth it. Uh, you can walk, you can sit there, usually by yourself. There's nobody there and watch the sun sink into Monterey Bay 25 miles away. So what about this whole process and project for you? Did you want to make money off this? Yeah. Do you need to make money off yeah. this? Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I basically, um, I was living on my, what was left of my 401k. Uh, I did it on spec. I had no advance. Ideally, I, was, I wanted to get an advance from some publishing company and they'd give me, even if it was 20,000 bucks, or fifty thousand bucks, and then you go out and you write the book and do the traveling and everything, while you're spending the publisher's money. Nobody gave me a dime, so it came down to the. I, but when I tried to sell the book before I went, everybody said the publishers and the agents and everybody said, you've got to make the trip first. You just can't say you're going to take this trip. Nobody's going to give you a dime. So I did the trip and I came back, and it was very easy to get an agent after I'd made the trip, and that's true. But it, it was impossible to get any of the legacy or the traditional publishers in New York to fork over any money. What do you think? Are you going to make enough money on this to make it worthwhile? Oh, it's already worthwhile. I had, you know, to me it's this <laughs> being here with you is, is, is reward enough. Um, it's selling about four or five copies a day. And if, and if you do the math, and I make three or four bucks a copy, if this will bring me in 400 bucks a month for as long as I live, it's like a second little Pittsburgh Post-Gazette pension. What outlet gave you the most attention on this and has done the most good for you in American media? Reason Magazine, my friends, my libertarian friends uh, at Reason. Um, I wrote everything I wrote for the Post-Gazette uh, within four weeks after I came back from my trip. I made my statement that the book was a literary fraud, all that stuff. Five months later, Reason Magazine published a larger, expanded version of that Post-Gazette article. I was able to get someone I knew at the New York Times to wave it in front of the New York Times. No national media had paid any attention to me other than, than uh, uh, actually, that on the media, the NPR station. They were smart. They were, they were on it. They were good. But that was back in December. But no print media. Reason did, did the article, New York Times saw it, and once they did see it, I had a call from Charles McGrath of the New York Times. He did an article about me and what I, my, my, my uh, claims, and the power of the New York Times is, is, is awesome. Uh, I was suddenly given credibility. I was reading my name in Hungarian, all over the, literally all over the world, the story of Steinbeck's book Travels with Charlie being outed as a as a piece of heavily fictionalized piece of work went all over the world. Our guest Bill Steigerwell lives in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Spent ten years at the Los Angeles Times, a number of years with the Pittsburgh Post Gazette and mm -hmm. the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh, yes. and has a book that we've been talking about called Dogging Steinbeck: Discovering America and Exposing the Truth About Travels with Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at QA.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.